So um, first of all, I wanna thank all of you for being on time today uh, because the number one thing, we're, this is a course on winning the seller. And the number one thing you don't want to do with sellers is be late, right? That would be not a good thing. If you're going to your seller appointments, you don't want to be late. So pat yourselves on the back if you already are here and you're on time. And as this is a hybrid class, hi, Jenny. Jenny's joining me here in person. Um, uh, we will do our best to go back and forth between Zoom as well as people in person. And I just want to mention, so this is Keller Williams University Win With Seller course. It's part of the Keller Williams University curriculum. And it's an amazing course on, how, on the whole seller cycle and how to win more sellers in your business. <clears throat> um, and it's actually an eight-hour course that we have... Uh, that I'm admitting people while I'm talking to you guys. And I know Abigail's helping me with that. It's an eight hour course that we have divided into four two hour sessions because we know that you guys have other things going on. And it's really difficult to do an eight hour course all in one day. So we divided into four, four different parts. And, um, and I'm doing session one, the first part of it. And Abigail is downloading into the chat the um, student manual that goes along with the course. So um, for those of you who are in Zoom, we are downloading that for you, okay? And then I'm gonna do the PowerPoint. And again, I'm gonna do the first section. So again, thank you all for being here on time. Let, I'm just gonna go ahead and start sharing my screen with the PowerPoint. I guess I didn't introduce myself. I think every single person here knows me, but I will go ahead and do a quick introduction. So, given the fact that we are um, recording this and it will show up on YouTube, my name is Laura Gleason and I'm the team leader for the Keller Williams Santa Clara Valley office. And I've been a team leader for five years and a team leader in this office for one year, almost one year and um, have been with Keller Williams for over eight years now. And I have a master's degree in higher education administration. So I love to teach. It's one of my favorite parts about this company are all the amazing courses that we have. And even, you know, I've been in real estate for 21 years now. And I've worked with many sellers and I've worked in many different types of markets. When you work 21 years, you definitely work different markets, up markets, down markets, because markets um, do go up and down. And when I go over a course like this that Keller Williams University has created, I'm just always amazed at how great their courses are and how thorough they are. And if you just follow what is presented to you, how much better your business is gonna be. And um, many of you have heard me tell this story before. I didn't find Keller Williams till I'd already been 13 years in the business. And, uh, and, and then I started getting to teach some of these courses. I was given the opportunity to teach some courses. And it's super exciting to me um, to get to present this information to you and to help you think about it as it relates to your business. So um, we're gonna get started with Win With Sellers. So let me share my screen with you and we'll get to the PowerPoint. And I believe, can everybody at home see the PowerPoint? I need you to let me know. You can see it behind me or you can see it. Let me put it in slideshow mode. I think you're just gonna see it behind me. Somebody has gotta unmute and talk we, to me. We can see the PowerPoint. That's okay. the main focus. Awesome, thank you very much. Was that, who was that, Robbie? Deepak. Oh, thanks, Deepak. Okay, I'm going to share my slideshow and we should be good to go. So, um, and then Abigail, if you can please drop, continue to drop in the chat a few times the um, student download for this because as new people join, they do not get the chat that's already been there previous to them. Okay. So you're gonna see in your student manual on page three that there is some preparation pre-work that we're recommending that you um, have for this class. Um, you should have your telephone, phone numbers for five to 10 new sellers that you wanna contact, copies of your lead sheet and pre-listing package if you have them, a copy of your listing presentation if you have one, 
Um, and the following lead generation and lead conversion numbers from your business, if you have them. Numbers from your business week. Um, how many contacts do you make per week? How many of these uh, contacts that you make meet your definition of a lead? How many of those leads become appointments? How many of those appointments become signed listing contracts? How many contracts between sellers and buyers have you written this year? And how many of those contracts have you written that have actually closed, turned into a closing? So those are the things that they're asking you to think about ahead of time um, on page three. Okay, before I go any further, is everybody good? Does everybody have the student workbook? You guys in front of me, you have the student workbook? Okay, so um, what are you following along on right now? Are you just checking Zoom? Okay. Do you have a Um, No. Raymond, if I, um, if Abigail emails you the student workbook really quick, can you print two copies of it for the people in the room? Thank you. Abigail, can you please email it to Raymond really quick? Yeah, there sure. Download, there's the download also that, are you seeing the download, Jenny? Yeah, I saw it, yeah. Okay. Okay, and then after page three, you're going into the table of contents for the entire course. Like I mentioned, this is an eight hour course that we've divided into two, four two hour sessions. And so this entire table of contents, this entire student packet takes you through the eight hour course. Okay, and today we're gonna to be covering the mindset introduction part and we're gonna be covering lead conversion. That's what we're doing today. And then on Thursday, Alan will be covering the pre-listing and listing consultation. So the pre-listing package, as well as the listing consultation. And then next week, Donna will be covering servicing and marketing and offer and negotiation and on Tuesday next week. And then Bruce will be covering contract to close and post-close systems on Thursday next week. So we're gonna get you through the entire course. All right. So we're going to start out a little bit by in the introduction talking about your mindset as well as models, okay? And so if you're following along in the student manual, we're on page seven. Everybody good? All right. Um, at this point, just at least print one for her really quick. You front it front and back, print one, please. Okay. Thank you. We're getting you there, Yvonne. Okay. All right, everybody, I think we're good to go. We're going to keep moving here. So starting out, I love this part about Keller Williams. We always start with mindset. Why are you here today? Why is this class important to you? Um, why in your career is this important? So if you're looking on page eight, um, there's, some, there's some questions. Let me go ahead and read this part, the beginning part to you. Imagine yourself a year from now. You walk into your office Monday morning and see the stack of leads you will call. You call each one, connecting with them effortlessly, saying the right things, and exploring how you can help. You're confident that you'll set appointments with many of them. After your calls, you have five appointments booked and a solid follow-up plan for the rest. In fact, you have already done your homework for each seller and know what pricing you'll recommend. All of your appointments go well and you sign all except one. So four listings you sign. You didn't feel it would be a great match so you referred that fifth one to somebody else. Four new clients in a week is a big win that boosts your motivation. Your motivation is even higher as you attend two closings in the afternoon. That feeling of motivation and success propels you every day. Okay, so that's a year from now. That's a great picture. So when you, you back go backtrack to today, which is June 14th, 2022, why are you here today? And there's some questions it's asking you to, um, to write down. So the questions are, what do you enjoy most about working with sellers? What are some of the challenges, if any, of working with sellers? What is your business goal for your listing business this year? And how will you know when you've achieved your goal? So I want you guys to take a minute to think about those questions and write down your answers. What do you enjoy most about working with sellers? 
What are some challenges, if any, of working with sellers? What is your business goal for your listing business this year? And how will you know when you've achieved your goal? All right, so who would like to share? Why are you here today? Who'd like to share? Okay, I'm just gonna let everybody know that I am gonna be asking you to participate a lot in the next two hours. I promise you every single page, I'm gonna be asking for volunteers. We're gonna do this class together. So who would like to get us started? Why are you here today? Tell me a little bit more about what you enjoy about working with sellers. This is Myrna. Myrna. Um, so I'm here because I just got my first listing. Um, we're prepping. Congratulations. I'm doing a Thank you. So I'm prepping the property with another agent. So I'm co-listing the property. Um, so I'm here to learn about how to do more listings. Um, I think one of the things that I, um, I, I guess, enjoy working with sellers is that I'm looking at it more as a project management because you're basically, I, feel, I see it as a project where uh, you have to go in, look at the property, see if anything, give any recommendations uh, and work with the client, kind of help them move out of the house, uh, helping them find a storage, like all these things that go along with it that... Um, so I see it as a big project and I feel like my role is like as a project manager to make sure that everything goes smooth, that I help them meet their needs uh, and go beyond what they're expecting of us, of me. That's good. I love that. I 100% agree. Project real estate, being a real estate agent is definitely a project manager um, position. Thank you very much for sharing and participating. Uh, who else would like to share? Jenny. Oh, so... So should, I, so should I answer the challenges question? Sure, let's, okay. yeah. Yeah, so some of the challenges uh, working with sellers are like um, <clears throat> any seller expectations. That's very important, <laughs> especially in the pricing. And, uh, and also when the buyer um, fall out, you know, buyer back out, um, that's very challenging for, for a leasing agent. <laughs> Yeah, so like yeah, um yeah, so and also like another challenge is um uh, where the seller um, is going to, you know, um willing to so have to manage yeah, the yeah. next step. Yeah. Those are really good. And as our markets shift, which we already know the markets are starting to shift, we're not getting as many buyers um, and, yeah. and the expectations with your sellers and every different market can be slightly different. Yeah. So we're actually gonna be spending a lot of time in, the, in these four classes talking about that, talking about um, seller expectations, how you manage those. I wanna encourage you to uh, talk to all four of the instructors because we've we're broken this into four instructors and ask them how they handle shifting markets, okay? What they're doing differently now as they talk to their sellers and that sort of thing. Um, is, let's do one more. Anybody else want to share why they're here today? Oh, sorry, hold on, time out. Um, your uh, presentation is on presenter view, so the people on Zoom can see two slides at the same time. Okay. And, okay, thank you. All right, hold on, you guys. I'm going to start it over and see if I can fix that. <laughs> 
So you guys are seeing two things at the same time. Okay, hang on. That's what I was told. So you guys are seeing this. Yeah. Ah, oh, shoot, hang on a minute. Let me stop, let me do it this way. I think it's on the actual slide themselves. No, yeah, you're not. Oh, I got you. There you go. <laughs> okay, so one moment, please. And then you're printing. Yeah. Okay. All right, I think what's gonna happen though is now you guys are gonna see this. I can't do it both ways. So since so you guys are just gonna have to bear with the two slides while the people on Zoom see it the other way, okay? All right, so what could one more person share why, why you're here today? Why is this class important to you? Uh, hi, it's uh, Danielle. Hi, hi Danielle. <laughs> so, um, uh, hold on. So the reason I'm here because I want to start like uh, know how to you know go to get uh, some listings by uh, like advertisement because before my listings are all are from referral or my yeah. old buyer and they want to sell so they so they do it for me uh, for them and so now I want to see I'm starting to you know do some marketing to door knock or whatever, you know, so <laughs> kind of want to, yeah, because, uh, and also the reason why I want to, I like to uh, work with buy, uh, seller is because I, um, I kind of uh, want to help them, you know, get the house uh, look better before we put them in the market. And uh, like my, one of my listing last year, I helped the buyer, I helped the seller uh, start from like how to remodel their house and make it nicer. So I help them choose the color, choose the material, and also like oversee all the process while they are doing the remodeling. So it's kind of very satisfying <laughs> to do that because I'm good at like choosing color and like good taste of awesome. how it looks. So, so the, yeah, so um, I think it's very nice to, you know, it's like kind of like, kind of like doing a project. It's really good. So right, I like want to like try to, project. yeah. Right try to get more listing, even though the market is now it's harder to sell, but I think it's still good, you know, to get listings. <laughs> okay. Yep. We're going to cover marketing. Yeah. We're going to cover prepping your listing, getting it ready to sell. We're going to cover talking to your seller. So that's what this entire course is all about. So this is going to be great. Yeah. Um, if yeah. you guys are putting stuff in the chat, I cannot see it. So Abigail, hopefully you'll help me with that a little bit. Because it looks like there's something in the chat. Maybe that's Abigail putting the information into the chat. Is that what it is? Okay, great. All right. Well, thank you for sharing. And yes, all of those things are going to get um, covered. Um, I just want to get some, do some perspective here as we talk about mindset. Uh, we still have great markets here, you guys. So my dad sold real estate in Michigan, which is where I'm from. And their average market time was two years. Well. We still have really good market time here. So keep in mind that many times what we put out there and what we say can have a positive or negative impact on our clients, okay? And uh, it real estate, frankly, was pretty easy the last few years. If you had listings, it was pretty easy. And I'm looking forward to the market shifting a, a bit because what happens during a shifting market is the professional realtors show up. Those who are doing it for a lifetime business show up and they continue to build your skills, which is why I believe you're all here today for this class. Those people who got their light, it's not that hard to get a real estate license. Let's face it. You can make a lot more money than a doctor and the doctor takes 12 years to become a doctor. You take three classes, you pass the state exam and you're a real estate agent and you can make a lot more money. And so it's easy entry not necessarily easy results, right? But easy entry. And so those who were in it for the easy money are probably going to go, nope, I'm out. It's too hard now. I'm going to go find something else to do in my life. So those of you who stick around and take classes like this, 
are the professionals that are showing up that are going to get all the business that the easy money people have said I'm out and left behind. There's still going to be buyers and there's still going to be sellers. There are still in every market out there reasons that people buy and sell in their lives. Sometimes those reasons are attached to the economy and sometimes they're not. It's life changes, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. People buy stuff, they're, you know, grow a family, family leaves, they sell stuff, all those different kinds of life events that happen that, me, that are why we're in this business for a lifetime. So pat yourself on the back if you are a professional and you have shown up. And um, I'm looking forward to what's ahead for us because those of us who grow our skills are going to do great in any kind of market. All right. So moving on, we're going to move on to slide number four. I'm working on it. Here we go. Um, who would like to read this? This is, I'm asking you, we're on, on page nine, Mindset and Practice of Top Agents. And this is a quote from Gary Keller. Who would like to read this quote? Okay, Jenny, let's hear it, please. Thank you. <laughs> Words of wisdom. When you, interview the uh, when you interview the very top people and ask them what their biggest challenge is, <clears throat> invariably, they will let you, they will tell you it is mindset, keeping it strong, focused, and a positive in the midst of many challenges they encounter every day on their way to the top and is staying there. The vast majority say this is their top issue, not lead, but mindset. That's awesome. Yeah. Thank you. So that's a quote from Gary Keller. Uh, Gary Keller is, for those of you who don't know, Gary Keller is the name behind Keller in Keller Williams, and he is the chairman of our company and has um, been with this company for the 39 years of this company. He does a ton of research, and in, that, in doing that research, it's helped him to write books like the Millionaire Real Estate Agent book, which is what this course is based on. Um, and uh, so these are great words from Gary Keller. So I'm just going to move down the page with you and, and, do a, and read a couple of things to you. Agents who succeed at a high level with sellers are persistent, dedicated, and consistent in their business. They have worked with enough sellers to be able to anticipate and handle almost every type of scenario with ease. According to our research, top listing agents commonly excel in the following areas. Okay, so again... This is, Gary Keller has actually interviewed the top agents. This is what he does in his career, in his job. He interviews the top agents all over the country and now all over the world. Um, not necessarily with Keller Williams. He interviews agents from all different types of companies, real estate companies. And in doing so, he's been able to gather a lot of evidence that has helped him write the books he's um, written. And so based on all of that research, what he's finding is that this is what... Uh, the top listing agents commonly excel in. They prioritize and manage leads. They know their sellers. They're decision facilitators. They master their scripts. They hire a coach for accountability. They know their numbers. They use time efficiently and effectively. They leverage technology and they embrace the six personal perspectives. So six personal perspectives is another course that we teach um, on growth and mindset at Keller Williams. And so they're just um, referencing it here. I'm not really going to go into a lot of detail for it, but we're going to cover all of these other things in this course with you guys today. Now, I have a question for you before I move on. Why work with your seller? Why work with sellers? Why is that important in your business? Why work with sellers? Generate more business opportunities. Generate more business opportunities. Why else? more control of the, the cycle, the process of buying and selling. You're in more control. Why other reasons why you focus on sellers? Okay, here's a Laura quote. Actually, I think I might've borrowed it from Gary. <laughs> um, if you focus on the listings, the buyers will come. If you focus on the listings, the buyers will come. I think I borrowed it from Gary. I can't 100%. I heard it from somebody. I think it's Gary. If you focus on the listings, the buyers will come. If you're only working with buyers, what are you always looking for? Listings. If you're only working with buyers, you don't have any listings. You're always waiting for someone else to generate a listing. 
If you focus on sellers, guaranteed in any market, the buyers will come. Some markets might be a little tougher than others, but if you don't have the listings, you're always waiting for some other real estate agent to get you the listing for your buyers. Does that make sense? Top listing agents always focus on both. They focus on listings and they also focus on buyers, typically a 50-50 split. Top, top agents that are so busy with listings every single week that they really don't have time to service buyers, what do those agents do with their buyers? What's that? They, or they give them to an agent on their team. They refer them to somebody else and collect a referral fee, or they have a, an agreement with a buyer's agent on their team that the buyer agents on the team are going to work with the buyers so that the, the listing agent can focus on the sellers, right? Mm -hmm. um, it, so um, Yvonne mentioned control. Agents with listings control the business. Agents with listings control the business. Okay. So now moving on to slide five, I'm gonna read this part to you. This class is about mastering proven models to grow a seller business. Models provide the foundation for success. Once you have mastered the foundation, then you get to be creative. So where do our models come from that we talk about at Keller Williams? They come from this book, The Millionaire Real Estate Agent, that I'm going to show you again. You guys see my copy has, sti has sticky notes all over it. It has highlights all the way through it. It has pages, I call it dog-eared, fold folded down, um, because I've read this book so many times and I teach from it so much. So that's what my, my copy looks like that I'm showing you. Um, I, I always like to really stress the importance of this book. So again, Gary Keller, this, okay, wait, let me back up and say it this way. So we live in a time in our uh, world of what I call paid opinion, where um, people get paid a lot of money to write books about their opinion and how to do this, opinion on how to get rich, opinion on how to do that. Um, all of our news stations are probably one hour of new news a day and 23 hours of paid opinion. You got panel after panel that's in front of you giving you their opinion on the news. So we definitely live in a paid opinion time in our, in our lives right now. Well, this isn't a book about paid opinion. This is an opinion book, okay? This is a book where Gary Keller interviewed the top agents in the country who were all earning over a million dollars. And in his interviews, he discovered that they had the same patterns that were showing up that were making them successful. And he wrote a book on the patterns. That's what this book is. It's a book about systems and models and patterns that show up that have proven to be successful and help people reach millionaire status. Now, that's up to you if you want to reach millionaire status or not. But even if you want to get to 500,000 or 250,000, do you think that the same systems and models would help you as well? And one of my favorite things that I quote at Keller Williams is the idea of R and D. R and D, R, letter R and the letter D, R and D. R and D usually stand for research and development. And at Keller Williams, it's affectionately known as rip off and duplicate. Mm -hmm. So we've got people who are very, we have a culture of caring and sharing at this company. And we have people who are top agents who are willing to share what they're doing, show you what's worked for them and say, here, give it a try. This could work in your business as well. And most of the top agents are following the systems and models from the classes that we teach and from the books that have been uh, written. So again, what you're seeing on your screen right now is the millionaire real estate agent. Um, oh, it doesn't, does it have a page, page 37 of the millionaire MREA book. And it's, it's stressing to you that a business that is stable starts with a foundation of models, and then you add creativity on top of it. If you start with creativity and then you add models, it's going to be tippy. It's not going to be a stable business. It's going to be very unstable. Okay. I can give you an example of that. I was uh, at an open house um, situation recently with a brand, 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 brand new agent. And he was doing some learning and he was super excited about becoming a listing agent and he was going to focus on luxury. And his idea was to spend a whole bunch of money videotaping the most beautiful homes in Santa Cruz and, um, and creating a video montage to, to um, 
support his business. So he was going to actually go door to door and knock at the most beautiful homes right on the cliffs, you know, overlooking the ocean, beautiful. Typically in Santa Cruz, that's $4 million and above. It can be a $6 million home. These are the most expensive homes we have. And he was going to knock on their doors and ask if he could videotape their homes for his video montage to, to show off that he was a listing agent. And then maybe some of them would actually want to sell. Is that creative? That's pretty creative. Is that based on any kind of systems or models? No. So my suggestion is learn this course, learn how to work with sellers and get some um, experience underneath you and then add some creativity. So that's basically what this is showing you here. We, I want you to be creative and I want you to have a business that you're passionate about. This person was very passionate about video. And so that would have been something that um, could have been good for him as long as there's a foundation of really solid tools that you've learned first. Does that make sense? Okay, so rip off and duplicate. Follow what the top agents are doing. You're gonna be learning from top agents during this course that are gonna help teach this course that are willing to share with you what they're doing and feel free to learn from them um, and, and use that in your business. All right. So for this course, we are going, and I'm on page 11 now, for this course, we're going to be going over the seven-step seller service cycle. Seven-step seller service start cycle, starting with lead, gen lead conversion. Sorry, it's not lead generation, it's lead conversion. That's what we're covering today. And then the second, on Thursday, Alan is going to be covering the pre-listing and listing consultation. Next Tuesday, Donna is going to be covering servicing and marketing and offers and negotiation. And then next Thursday, Bruce is going to cover contract to close and post-close system. So that's how we're breaking this down for you into four different classes. Okay. Do you agree that if you got, if you learned these different stages of the seller service cycle, remember we're tied, you guys have brought this up beautifully that we are project management. And when you look at these seven steps, do these look like seven different steps of project management to you? Yeah, it does, doesn't it? It breaks it down for you. And uh, do you agree that if you were to learn some skills in each of these areas, you're gonna be much better at, at servicing your sellers and being a good seller project manager? Would you agree with that? Okay. All right, so we're moving on. Oh, actually, let's define them a little bit. It's page 12 for everybody. So it says here on the side, I'm supposed to say this to you. The goal is to learn this model until you've memorized it and you do the steps automatically with the seller. What I love about this is, like I mentioned, when I started with Keller Williams, I'd already been in the business for 13 years. I've worked with many sellers. I'd done many of these steps um, based on different things I'd learned over the years, not quite the Keller Williams way. And then I look at it and I'm like, wow, this is amazing how they have this all laid out for you. If you just follow it, it it's amazing. So step one is lead conversion. The lead conversion process capture, connect, close, and cultivate is about being fast, gathering information, pre-qualifying sellers as able, ready, and willing to sell and setting the appointment. That's what we're going to talk about today. And then on Thursday, it's pre-listing before the appointment, deliver a pre-listing package to your lead and follow up to confirm the appointment. Remember, it's about sellers and meeting their needs. Listing consultation. At the appointment, you will ask questions and listen thoroughly to determine the seller's needs and wants. You will cover the home selling process, your service standards, and get a signed contract. This is about earning the seller's business. Servicing and marketing. The goal is to sell quickly at a great price with the least possible amount of hassle. Great service and communication will build a bond with your clients. It's about the seller's experience as you get the property sold quickly. Offers and negotiation. One of the most crucial services you provide your sellers is guidance on rece receiving and responding to an offer. Your goal is to alleviate their fears, remove roadblocks, and lead them to a timely response that closes the sale. It's about guiding them to a successful conclusion. Bullet, uh, the next is contract to close. Bulletproof your deals by thoroughly tracking and mo monitoring every phase of the inspection, title, and lending process, leveraging command technology. That has an old Keller Williams word there. So it's 
our new technology is command technology, levering, leveraging command technology for smooth document processing with your clients and the buyer. Post-closed systems, by following up with well-chosen services and gifts, you will create clients for life who bring you deals, referrals, and influence. By doing this, you demonstrate that you understand that it's all about the seller. That's what we're covering in this course. So on the next page, on page 13, I would like you guys to think about this part. Are you ready to win the sellers? Are you ready to adopt the mindset and practices of those who have succeeded before you, the R&D part? Let's start with a snapshot of where you're at today. So take a look at this little um, questionnaire and check the boxes to indicate where you're, where you're currently doing in your business. So there's 13 questions it's asking you. I, I currently do the following. One, I time block, for and time block four and lead generate three hours a day at minimum. Mark that box if that's true. And uh, I would say that's four to five days a week. Two, have a database of METs and past clients and consistently communicate with them. Three, have taken Ignite and or Bold at least once. Practice and use the scripts from not Ignite and or Bold. Five, have been in business approximately two years or more and consistently close 16 or more seller transactions a year. Six, use the available KW technology tools in my business. Seven, have a business website that attracts and captures customer inquiries. Eight, actively use social media in my business. Nine, set goals for the numbers of appointments and listings I need per day and per week to reach my goals. I'm immersed in my market center. I know the staff. I have a network of colleagues and vendors, and I attend classes and events. Eleven, I attend MegaCamp. 12, I attend family reunion, and 13, I participate in MAPS coaching or any other coaching if you're already coaching. That's what we're talking about. So uh, mark the ones that are you already are doing and, and tally your score, and then circle the at least one of the items that you can take immediate action on. If there's something that you're not doing, circle one, just one, and let's take action on that. And then finally, okay, sorry, not finally. Um, we're going to go to page 14. You guys can, can someone read the um, definition of actions for me? It's very short. On page 14. Am I going too fast? Can you read, will you read it, Alexa? I can read it. Yeah. Okay, let's hear it, John. What's, what's the, um, the definition of actions? The fact or process of doing something typically to achieve an aim. Thank you. All right, so three questions for you. Think about your listing appointments. What did you do in the process to enable that success? So you've had successful listing appointments. What did you do that made it successful? Okay, number two, <clears throat> think about the listing appointments that you've had that weren't successful. What did you do in the process to enable that it wasn't successful? What could you do differently? What didn't go well? Write down a couple of thoughts on that. All right, and number three, do you have any limiting beliefs that are keeping you from the goal of changing your actions? Do you have any limiting beliefs that are keeping you from changing your actions? And how would you redirect that thinking?
So the last part on page 15 in terms of mindset, getting us ready for this course is getting the most out of this experience. So on page 15, uh, this is a typical thing that you see in most KW courses. They talk about which one are you? Are you the prisoner? Are you the vacationer? Are you the explorer? <clears throat> so when you're thinking about why you're here and why you're taking this course, I hope you're not a prisoner. I hope you're not there because you were told you have to be there. So it has to be there, doesn't wanna be there, doesn't know why they're here. <laughs> the second one's a vacationer. Oh, a day in training is better than a day on the job. I'm in this class because I really don't wanna lead generate. So I'm here just because I love to hear Laura teach. And then the explorer. Yes, that's what we want. You're excited and curious about new knowledge, skills, and tools and you will, that you will discover in this class. So just think about why you're here. And, and um, remember, this is a four-part class. And we're going to ask you to participate. You're going to have lots of chance to participate, ask questions, and really learn. So um, take notes. Uh, definitely use the student materials and that sort of thing. And um, be also thinking about your pre-listing presentation, your listing presentation, um, your scripts, a lot of the things that we're gonna be working on here. You're gonna get a lot of opportunity to learn from some top agents who are gonna be sharing with you. Um, so R&D what they're sharing in order to help you grow in what you're doing as well. All right, before I move on, I'm gonna move on to chapter one, lead conversion. Does anybody have any thoughts so far about what we've talked about? Okay, we're gonna move on to lead conversion. So this chapter reviews the entire process of converting leads to get appointments. I'm gonna say right now, this is not considered a beginner course for Keller Williams, okay? This is not a lead generation course that's gonna to talk to you about the different types of lead generation that you do in order to get seller leads. We cover that in other courses. So this is kind of jumping right into lead conversion. First, you have to generate a lead in order to be able to convert it, right? So we teach courses in Ignite um, through our coaching that we do, as well as through Bold. We teach a lot of information on lead generation. We're not really gonna cover that during this part. We're gonna skip right to lead conversion, okay? Just wanna make sure you guys are understanding that. All right, I am on page 18, and we're gonna talk about conversion ratios. I would love for somebody to read the top part that start right underneath conversion ratios. Who would like to read that for me? Okay, thank you. If you can read as loud as possible because you're mat, you're covered. Okay. One of the best practices of top listing agents is knowing the number. Do you know your own? One important number is your conversion ratio. That is how many appointments it takes to get a signed listing agent. And can you read that quote too, please? The quote, converting leads to appointments and converting appointments to listing. Seller agreements are huge drivers of your economic success. They are both accomplished by a skill presentation with a firm grasp of script and dialogue. Great, That's thank you. Time. Thank you for that. So just setting the stage, why conversion is important. So now look at the bottom part, the numbers game. Your answers to the following four questions will determine your current conversion rates. I'm going to say this is where most people fall off. They don't even track their numbers. They don't know their conversion rates. And, and hey, if you haven't tracked your numbers, that's okay. Can you start today and move forward on that? Everyone can start today with their numbers and, and move forward so that you're learning your conversion rates. So the first question is, how many contacts do you make in a week? How many contacts do you make in a week? Write a number down. How many of those meet your definition of a lead? That's the B question. How many of those contacts that you make in a week meet your definition of a lead? Write that number down. 
How many of those leads become appointments? Write that number down. And how many appointments become signed listing contracts? So, and then you're, we're gonna calculate it. So I just went ahead and put down um, some numbers that are more so recommended at KW. Does anybody have an idea of how many contacts we recommend you make in a week? Say it again. A hundred, good job. You get a star. A hundred bold, I think says 200, but a hundred contacts a week. So if I make 100 contacts a week and 50% of them become or an actual definition of a lead, I would put 50 down. So 100 contacts a week, 50 of them are actually a lead. And of those 50, five of them become appointments. And of those five, three of them become listing contracts, okay? So if I'm gonna do my calculation at the bottom, that would be 50% contact to lead conversion. It would be 10% leads to appointment conversion, and it would be 60% appointment to listing contracts conversion. Now here's a question. So the first thing is if you're not tracking, first of all, the number one thing that you track is how many contacts you make in a week, then how many of those are leads, then how many are converting to appointments and then converting to signed contracts. Whether it's buyers or sellers, it's the same thing. Right now in this class, we're focusing on sellers. Uh, the first question um, that I have, or important, the first thing is if you're not doing it, then that's something you can start today and start working on tracking. Professionals track in every sales career. You're in a sale, believe it or not, by the way, you are in a sales career. You're actually in a career of how to sell yourself. And the byproduct of selling yourself is that a property exchanges hands. So you're not actually selling properties, you're selling yourself. Why would somebody work with you beside, in, instead of another agent? So you're learning how to sell yourself, okay? So it is a sales career. And um, in any sales career, you know, any inside sales, outside sales, you track. You're hired by a company to do sales, you're tracking. Well, guess what? You've hired yourself. You own your own business in real estate. And so if you're being a smart business owner, which is what our goal is for you at Keller Williams, our goal is to create smart business owners, you would track your numbers. Because in any sales floor that you work on in any industry, high-tech sales, any kind of sales, you're tracking your numbers. Because that's how you grow. If you don't track, you don't know how to grow. So I have a question for you. How do you increase your conversion rates? How do you increase your conversion rates? It's not a trick question. It's, it's not, I promise. Uh, by identifying the gaps, like why you fail to get a listing and then improving upon those. Yeah. So... Conversion rates change when your skill level changes. That's kind of what Deepak just said. So you have to identify where the, the pitfalls are, the gaps, and then learn, figure out your plan of action in order to overcome those pitfalls or those gaps, right? So that's why you're taking a class like this. Does that make sense? So how can you increase your conversion rates? First of all, you have to track them, number one. Well, number one is you have to lead generate. Then you need to track it. And then you identify, where am I falling short? Am I falling short um, because I'm not like the from A to B, that I'm making 100 contacts a week, but they're not really a, an actual lead? Is that where I'm falling short? Or... Am I not, am I falling short because I'm not converting very many leads into appointments? So do I need to change my scripts? Do I need to change what I'm doing to actually get these, these leads to turn into appointments? And then if I've got appointments, but I'm not getting signed listing contracts, is there something I need to do with my scripts during the listing presentation or something I need to do with my listing presentation? in order to increase that, increase that conversion rate. Does that make sense? So if you break it down and you're tracking all of these different parts, then you can identify what the pitfalls are. 
and grow your skills in those areas. Make sense? Does anybody have any comments or thoughts on that? Yeah, improving, you have a thought or a comment with, on improving the quality of the lead? Um, Is that, you're not sure what that, I meant by that? Yeah. Okay, does anybody have a thought on how you improve the quality of the lead? So you're, you're contacting 100 people a week, but you're not really getting 50 of them to be a lead. Maybe they're not motivated. Or... I think you just have a lot of contacts. Yeah, I, a lot of context. My thought would be maybe you're going to networking events or like, for example, I know a lot of people that go to real estate networking events where you're hanging out with other realtors. And you might, yeah, I, I was in touch with 100 people this week. Every single one of them was a realtor. They're not going to become a contact. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So it might be what types of lead generation you're doing to get yourself in front of potential buyers and sellers. Could be that. Um, so it's going back to that lead gen plan and, you know, am I door knocking? Am I doing open houses? Am I getting myself in front? Am, I'm attending great networking events. Um, are they turning into people who I'm actually talking to about real estate, talking about selling real estate or buying real estate or giving me a referral to somebody who they know who needs to buy or sell real estate or invest in real estate? Does that make sense? Does that help that a little bit? I want you guys to go to networking events that are outside of real estate. Yeah. <laughs> like go, to, go to some real estate networking events too, but go to some outside ones as well. Okay. Any other thoughts on, on this part, on the conversion part? So we're doing the lead conversion part of the cycle. Okay, and believe it or not, they break that down. So we're in lead conversion. And it all goes back to what you see in the Millionaire Real Estate Agent book on page 192. It goes back to this triangle of leads, listings, leverage. It always starts with leads, okay? Um, it always starts with leads. Leads lead to listings. So you'd move an arrow towards the listing side of the triangle. And then listings lead to an arrow to leverage and back around. You have enough listings, you need help. That's when you, you add leverage. But it starts with leads. You're not going to get the listings. You're not going to need the leverage if you don't start with leads. Okay, so that's our triangle. Leads to listings to leverage. Um, the millionaire real estate agent seller listing lead are the, sorry, let me start over. The millionaire real estate agents are seller listing lead generators first, marketers of those list seller listings second, and buyer lead generator generators third. So first you're a seller listing lead generator, then you're a marketer of those seller listings, because when you market the buyers show up. And then third, you're a buyer listing or buyer lead generation generator. Lead generation is also found in every step of the seller service cycle as you gain referrals and add leads and clients by leveraging your listing opportunities. So it's not just the beginning, it's every step. It's always going to be generation throughout. Never lose sight of the fact that your business always starts with leads. Um, the first L of leads, listings, and leverage, which is the model in the millionaire real estate. So again, back to my quote before, if you focus on the listings, the buyers will come. Who would like to read the Gary Keller words of wisdom at the bottom? This is really a good one. Who wants to read it? Bottom of page 20. Somebody on Zoom, who would like to read for me? I can read. <laughs> words of wisdom. To succeed in real estate, you must have client leads. It's that simple. Until you have enough leads to meet or exceed your goals, there is no other issue. No matter if you're a doctor, lawyer, or entrepreneur, everyone has two jobs, their chosen profession and lead generation. That is so powerful. Thank you, Deepak, um, for always participating. It's so powerful. He just says it right there. It's not just real estate. A doctor doesn't have a business without leads. A lawyer doesn't have a business without leads. Your mechanic doesn't have a business without leads. 
The person who does your hair doesn't have a business without leads, right? It's everyone who's selling themselves that own a, owns a business. They have two jobs. So important. You have two jobs. What are the two jobs? Yeah, I'd say lead generation and everything else. Lead generation and everything else. Super important to mark that part. Okay. Guess what? You guys get to read again some more. So we're on page 21. And we're going to talk about pre-qualifying for a listing lead first. Okay. There may be times when you have to adapt your definition of a lead. If you are closing deals as fast as you can, then you might shorten the number of days in the definition. If you have the capacity to close more deals, you expand and, and have expanded your team or the market isn't very hot, then you might lengthen the number of days. Okay, so I would like somebody to read the first paragraph there. So pre-qualifying for a listing lead on page 21. Who'd like to read that first paragraph? Okay, thank you, Yvonne. All these are not equal. The least most deserving of the space time are those that are qualified as, uh, as able, ready, and willing to sell within a predictable time frame. Your definition will include a length of time that suits the amount of business that you're doing and the amount of activity in the market. So, if I'm doing 200 to 300 deals a year, I can follow a list for 14 days. If I'm doing 25 years a year, I can probably follow that list for 30 days. So the busier you are, the shorter your definition of a list. Yeah, and thank so. you. Um, thank you for that. That's really important. So we are a large company with lots of different markets um, in the United States that we serve as a company at Keller Williams. And we tend to be what I call more volume heavy here and less units heavy because our volume is so, so high, the prices of our homes are so high that we tend to do less deals per year than other parts of the country. Although we definitely have agents um, here who are doing well over 100 deals a year or on a big team or have expansion teams that are doing 200, 300, 500 deals a year. So it depends on what your vision for your business is and how high you wanna grow because you certainly don't have to stop at 20 transactions a year or 50 or 100. We certainly have many people um, in this company at Keller Williams who are doing well over $500 a year, 500 deals a year, and many in the, in the Northern California area that are doing that as well. And if there's only one of you and your focus is 10 to 20 deals a year, you're going to be able to follow a lead a little bit longer. If there's one of you and your focus is 50 deals a year or more, you're probably going to def define a, what a lead is as a shorter amount of time. Okay. So, but the three important things are able, ready, and willing. Able, financially able to complete the transaction now. Ready, uh, ready and motivated to make strategic decisions now. And willing, willing to take action now. So a lead is all three of those things. If one of those things is missing, they're not, they're not going to be ready to list with you or at least sell with you. They might list, but then you're waiting and waiting for them to actually put the home on the market. Does that make sense? Anybody have any comments on that? Any questions? So on the next page, on page 22, it moves into it a little bit more detail. I love this part because this is the part as you're um, creating a sales pipeline of sellers who are going to sell. You're gonna think about them in three categories. You can define your categories differently. In this class, they're defining them as A, B, and C category. So they're defining an A lead as able, ready, and willing to do business in the next 14 days. And they're saying that you're going to be following up with them daily. This is someone who calls you on the phone and says, we need to get our house on the market in the next two weeks. Absolutely, you're going to be doing project management for them right now. Um, you're going to be scrambling because we typically take longer to get our listings ready to go in this area because we do all the work up front. We do the inspections up front. We get all the disclosures signed up front. And that's not necessarily how other um, markets do that. Some of them wait until the listing goes on the market and then they're doing disclosures and that sort of thing. 
Now, even home, even inspections in some markets don't happen until after you identify a buyer. So for us, we do a lot of the work up front here in our markets. And so an A lead they're defining is zero to 14 days. A B lead they're defining is 15 to 60 days. And a C lead they're defining as 61 or more days. So B lead would put them into your database and call every two to three days or at least once a week. And a C lead would be put them in your database and call them monthly. Um, I kind of redefined those. Um, I put an A lead as zero to two months. I put a B, for our market, zero to two months is an A lead. They're gonna sell in the next two months because you're prepping that property to get ready. A B lead, I put two to six months and a C lead, I put six plus months. It's kind of how, it's up to you. You can have your definitions be a little bit different based on what our markets are like around here, in my opinion. But you're defining their motivation, okay? That's what these are important about. And, and with that, then you're gonna follow up with them differently. Does that make sense? Does anybody have any questions on that? I'm sorry, say it again. My my C. I for me, a C lead could be six to months to two years. I mean, you know, you've got people that are you're gonna stay in touch with them. You're gonna not, you know, I'm a I'm in real estate for my life. Okay. I definitely have bills to pay in and food I wanna put on my table today. So I need the A leads. I need people, I need business that's selling now. And I know I'm in this business for a lifetime. And so I'm also gonna to continue to follow up this with the seller leads that might be six months to two years out. Cause I wanna be the one who they work with. Does that make sense? So for me, I'm building a business for both now and for the future. <clears throat> okay, any other questions? So again, I redefine them zero to two months as an A lead, two to six months a B lead, uh, six plus months as a C lead. Does anybody else have a def different definition that's worked for them? Okay, I'm gonna keep moving. Uh, I would like a, a volunteer to read the do column. <clears throat> Down on the bottom of page 22, do's and don'ts of lead generation. High producing listing agents do the left column. Who would like to read that for me, please? Come on, you guys, let's go. All right, thank you, Jenny. High producing listing agents do what? Practice highly productive lead generation. Prospects in a generate lead that meets their definition of a lead. Be, be organized and build their database daily. Have an effective 33 touch point. Practice consistent follow up on leads. Thank you. And we actually call that a 36 touch program now. 36 touches means three touches a month. Three times 12 equals 36. So 12 months. Three times 12. And, and I think they changed it to 36 just because it was easier math. Three times a month. Highly productive listing agents don't rely solely on the internet to feed them leads. They have other sources of lead gen. They don't change or add methods of lead generation randomly. You stick to a plan and you improve on it and you get better at it, okay? They don't wait for the number of leads they need to hit their goals and they don't skip um, follow-up. So it's not just lead generation, it's lead follow-up and lead conversion. I, and you got some people have heard me say this, what's the point in generating a lead if you're not gonna follow up with it? What's the point? Don't even be in this business if you're not following up. So you can't skip the follow-up, okay? All right, any thoughts on that before we move on? So this is what the lead conversion model looks like, okay? Think about the leads that you are currently working with. Where are you in the process with those leads? The, pro the process looks like you capture the lead, number one, then you connect with it, and then you're closing for the appointment. I always say there's closes along the way. It's not just one big closing at the end of escrow. It's closings along the way in a sales cycle that get you to the final closing. 
So you're capturing, then you're connecting, then you're closing. And if they are not able, ready and, ready and willing, you're cultivating. That's where number four steps in, okay? So first you capture leads by getting their contact information. Then you connect by establishing a relationship. Then you close for an appointment and eventually to buying or selling real property. And then you cultivate them to maintain and strengthen relationships. Who would like to read the paragraph at the beginning, the top? Come on, Zoom. <laughs> Who can read from uh, some of these Zoomers I know have other, biz other um, businesses they're in right now, which is why they're not fully participating with me. Um, lead conversion is all about pre-qualifying a lead and getting them to the appointment table quickly. If they don't pre-qualify, then put them in your database and move on to the next lead. One of the most important numbers that top agents track is the conversion of qualified leads to appointments and how quickly they can determine pre-qualification. Okay, we kind of talked about that at the last one. So do you, are capture and connect separate? Do they always happen in this sequence? No, sometimes they're simultaneous, okay? You're gonna get the cycle though. As you're doing this, you're gonna be getting it. Sometimes you've already captured their information and you're in a cultivation phase with them. And so you're continuing to connect. Um, let's look at it this way. Let's say I have a thousand people in my database, 500 people in my sphere of influence and a thousand um, in my database, okay? So 500 in my database or sphere of influence and 500 are leads that I have met at some point or another. I'm continually cultivating and connecting with them I've captured their information because you have to capture information in order to reach out to people. And then I'm continuing to connect and cultivate them. And of those thousand people in my database, uh, let's say my goal is that a hundred of them turn into a lead or a referral every single year. And that's who the ones that I'm getting to the appointment table. So they're not, if you've got say a thousand people in your database, they're not all gonna be active buyers and sellers at the same time, right? So you're going to keep cultivating them. You're going to keep connecting with them. You're going to keep showing them value so that when they are able, ready, ready and willing, they want to work with you. You come to the top of their mind as the, the real estate agent they want to work with or that they want to refer their friend or their neighbor or their coworker to. So there's no point in generating a lead if you're not going to follow up with it. This is a lifetime business of building and cultivating relationships. And that's why we recommend a program like a 36 touch where you're staying in touch with people 36 times a year in order to cultivate those relationships so that the day they are thinking about real estate, they're thinking about you. Okay, I wanna, I wanna make sure I didn't forget. I was, oh, I did forget something. So hold on, I gotta stop sharing. I wanna show you guys something that I think is really important to think about. So let me um, share this, my whiteboard. Can you guys all see the white screen? That's what, oh crap, you guys can't see it. Hold on, let me do it. Let me stop sharing again. I gotta do it differently. Okay, let me get back to, all right, I don't wanna end my Zoom. What happened? Can you guys see it? Oh, yay, everybody can see it now. All right, I just wanna show you something that I think is a really important thing to think about when you're thinking about lead generation and cultivating. I'm gonna draw. I'm gonna draw for you a Y. And I'm gonna put an arrow here and an arrow here. Those are arrows, supposed to be arrows. I'm gonna put a circle here. And I'm gonna put a Y here and an N here. This is, this is when I think about lead generation and cultivating to, for someone to get to become an actual client that they're actually able, ready and willing. And by the way, can you guys at home see my, see my scratchy drawing here? Somebody has to tell me if they can, Abigail, can they see it? Okay, thank you. 
So in every step of the way, you're at the Y in the road, you're at the circle. This is the, the you know, if you think about two forks in a road, you're right there at the, the Y or the V in the road, okay? With every relationship. And that relationship can either lead to a yes, I'm ready, willing, and able to sell a property. Or it can lead to, what do you think this one is? The N. Say it louder. It's a not, it's not a no. It's a not yet. Sorry. Oh my gosh, this writing is terrible. It's not a no. It's a not yet. So you're at the, you're in the V here in the road with every relationship and you're cultivating and cultivating. Okay. And that is going to lead you in one of two paths. Either yes, they are ready, willing, and able to buy or sell, or they're a not yet. They're not a no, they're just a not yet. Does that make sense? When you think about your real estate sales career in this way, it's a lifetime business that you're creating. Nobody's a no. There's very few no's. Okay, there's a couple. And you don't have to keep talking to them. If they're, if they're an actual no that has told you my husband or my wife or my, my sibling or whatever is a real estate agent and they're the person I'm going to use, well, okay, they may not be worth your time, money, energy, and resources, so you don't have to stay in touch with them. However, sometimes those people that have to use their family member um, as their agent would still refer you other people that are non-family members. So if you get their permission to stay in touch with them, you can still do that, okay? And sometimes our family member stops being a real estate agent because the market got too hard and they're no longer an agent. And if you followed up with them a little bit, you could then turn into their agent. So there's very few times that there, there's someone's a legitimate no. Um, for me, the, the legitimate no is a jerk that I don't want to work with. It's my business. I own it. I run it. And I can pick and choose who I reach out to. And I don't have to reach out to the jerks that I don't want to work with. But beyond that, there's very few legitimate notes. Even a person who passes away sometimes have property that they need to sell. So if you've been reaching out to them for years, hopefully you're the one who gets to sell that property. Okay, does that make sense? I like to show that. I think that one's a really important thing to show everybody. Now let's see if I can get back to the presentation. This is going to be the tr trick. Okay, let me see here. All right. Any thoughts on that? Before I go back, hi everybody. Hi Zoomers. All right, so you guys are seeing, so now I got to put this in from current slide. Okay. We are now on page. Um, talked about it went backwards i just finished page 23 we're now on page 25 we're now on page 25 this is basically talking about the capture part of the whole lead conversion model so uh it's capturing should always focus on page top of 25 number one capture Capturing should always focus on getting enough information so that you can contact the person over and over again. So you need their name, their phone number, their email address, their mailing address. Those are the things you need. Social media connected. I always say there's five things that make a complete contact. First and last name, phone number, email address, mailing address, and social media connections. There's lots of other information you can also can capture, but those are the most important five, okay? So it says kind of in there off to the side in that first section, no lead is captured until you have their contact information so that you are in control of when and how often you reach out to them. And then it goes on to talk about different seller lead opportunities for capture. You've got seller in residence. This person who lives there who needs to sell. You've got a job relocation seller. They're moving somewhere. They need to relocate and an investor seller. Can anybody think of any other seller types that you might be reaching out to? They're, they broke it down into these three. 
Seller in residence, job relocation seller, investor seller. What's that? Probate. That is a probate still somebody who's in the property though, right? Not necessarily. Okay, so probate's another one. Any others that you can think of? They're you trust. They're either a seller in residence or investor seller. I think either one of those. You're either a seller in residence or you're an investor seller. That's the three that they came up with. I mean, those are good three good ones that to think about. That's the capture part. Now we're going to move on to uh, let's see. I think I'm not, I think I'm still in connect. I think I'm still here, sorry. Okay. This says I'm page 16, 13. Okay, hold on, let me see if I'm in the right spot. Oh, there we go, capture. All right, now we're gonna move on to connect. So, um, The part that I thought was important on page 27 in the connect part is um, this is the part where you're, uh, you're, there's a couple of good parts in this. You're connecting behavioral styles. You're pre-qualifying the seller during the capture phase. Um, for me, there's a page 27, there's a script. Now let's talk about scripts for a second. This is, this goes back to that a triangle model at the beginning that talked about having a solid foundation first and then getting creative. This is important when you think about scripts. It's important for you to read the script verbatim, the way it's been written and memorize it before you get creative with it, okay? If you're like, oh, it doesn't sound like me. No, it doesn't sound like you because you haven't memorized it. And by the way, everybody uses scripts. Your doctors use scripts, your mechanics use scripts, your hairdresser use scripts, people who are your wait staff when you go to a restaurant, they use scripts. Everybody uses scripts. They don't, just don't sound like scripts because they've memorized them and they're natural at it. So when you think about um, creating a solid foundation first and then adding creativity in that triangle at the top, practice your scripts first, memorize them, read them. And then as you internalize them, your own personality will show up and they won't seem so scripted. Okay. So on page 27, there is a script here and it says, I'm a professional and my goal is to sell your house for the best price quickly with the least amount of trouble to you. Like your doctor or any other professional, I have to ask questions to understand your situation well enough that I can give you the best advice. It's a nice way to explain it. You're explaining why, you know, your job as a professional and just like a doctor or anyone else, there's certain questions you need to ask. Would you allow a doctor to um, operate on you without asking questions first? Well, why would a seller or a buyer allow you to work with them without asking questions first? Okay. So again, that one's, I'm a professional and my goal is to sell your house for the best price quickly with the least amount of trouble to you. Like your doctor or any other professional, I have to ask questions to understand your situation well enough so that I can give you the best advice possible, okay? That's an opening script that then gets you into um, when you're gonna be asking, these in this class, you're gonna be asking seller questions. Now, if you turn on to page 28, it also spends quite a bit of time talking about different personality styles and how you can and how that helps you connect with people. So um, they talk about the golden rule and the platinum rule would be treat others the way they want to be treated. Okay. So when you look at the different styles they're seeing here, they're showing here, you're seeing an assertive style a sociable style, a structured style, and a steady style. These are kind of from the DISC assessment, D-I-S-C. If anyone's ever taken a DISC assessment, this is where they're getting this from. Uh, assertive style, makes decisions easily, determined, persistent, and direct, quick to move forward and solve problems, has a clear sense of direction. That's a D. Sociable, socially confident, confident diplomatic, and tactful, practiced communicator, wide circle of contacts and friends. That's an I. Steady, listens intently, steady, calm demeanor, emotionally controlled, not flighty or whimsical, 
When expressing a feeling or opinion, others are likely to trust. That's an S. And then, um, thanks, Abigail. Structured, the C and a D-I-S-C. Structured, likes to be right, detail-oriented, accurate and thorough, follows rules and established procedures. It's gonna ask you when you're work when you're talking to other people, do you change the way you're talking to people? So on page 29. On page 29. Customer number one. Okay, so you want to look at page 28 and 29 together. Customer number one, I've done quite a bit of detailed research on the internet already and have talked to others in my neighborhood and already have a price in mind to, tell, to sell my house for. I wanna see all the data you have on this neighborhood before I make a decision to work with you. So how do you communicate with that person? To me, that's more of a C, someone who's very detail oriented, more of a C person, D-I-S-C, it's more of a C. You're going to provide a lot of detail, a lot of statistics, a lot of detail oriented information. Customer number two, I don't have time for a bunch of phone calls and meetings. Tell me what you think the home should be priced at and let's see if we can get this deal done. How do you communicate with that person? That's a D. Let's get it done. Okay. So you know what's really great in Silicon Valley? We have a lot of CEO type people that are get her done, D, D, D. And we have a lot of C type people that are very detail engineer oriented, right? They covered most of who we're dealing with right there in those first two. Okay, number three. I've lived here for 10 years and see a lot of changes. Our neighbor, Bob, who now owns several houses in the neighborhood. We got two neighbors this year, two new neighbors. I, keep, I really keep up with all the goings on in the neighborhood. Um, yeah, I think that's an I or an S. Somebody is definitely more social. So you're going you're gonna to get to know them. You're going to ask questions about their family, their kids, what your goals are, where do you want to go, what's important to you. You're going to get to know them. You guys are going to love each other by the end. And customers four and five, we really need to get this house sold. Um, I'm just not sure about this listing price. Uh, to me, those are probably, I, I don't know, those are short ones. I'm not quite sure I have enough information. I might have to ask a few more questions before I get. We really need to get this house sold. Could be a D. Um, I'm just not sure about this listing price. Could be someone who needs more detail. Uh, it's, I, it's meant to be a couple, so they have different concerns. And that's really important, too, because when you have two people making a decision, they don't necessarily have the same personality, right? So you have to, it, you have to meet the needs of both personalities. Good things to think about when you're talking to your clients, it's good things to think about what type of personality and how are you gonna match and mirror that personality to, so that they feel more comfortable and feel like you're the person to work with them. Um, I'm definitely more of a high D personality. I like to just get things done. And that means I have to slow down a lot for my people who are much more, much slower and more methodical um, and wanna chit chat quite a bit and want me to know about the, their dog's name and their turtle's name and their bird's name. and how many, you know, all those things that you just have to slow down and, and understand those personalities as well. Okay, on page 30, I want to bring you guys back here. I've been talking quite a bit. Um, who would like to read the top part? Page 30, pre-qualify the seller during capture. Who can read that part? Page 30 at the top. I can do it. This is Myrna. Thank you. Hi, Myrna. Thank you. Um, high production high agents. Go ahead. You do that part. High production agents use lead sheets. A lead sheet is a list of questions to ask and information to gather about the seller and the home. You don't have to think about and remember the script because it's written down. It's a system so you can be sure you're getting the information that you need and it can be improved over time. It saves you time by ensuring that all questions are answered. It helps you sound organized when talking to the lead. It quickly reveals the answer to the question, is this lead able, ready, and willing to list now? 
Thank you. I'll have you stop there. I just want to talk about, so it's on the next page. Page 31 is your pre-listing seller lead sheet. Okay, I'm just going to, all transparency to all of you, I did not learn about a lead sheet like this when I, I think probably until, uh, I don't think it was when I got to Keller Williams, but I'd probably been in the business at least 10 years before I'd even learned about a lead sheet like this. And honestly, where it became important was during the short sale times. Why do you think a lead sheet like this was important? A pre-listing lead sheet was important like this during short sale times. Does anybody have any ideas? Their motivation, it's remember it's able, ready and, ready and willing. Are they able? That became a much bigger question during short sale times. Did they have enough money to sell the house or did they need to do a short sale because they owed the bank more than the owed the bank more on the mortgage than the property was actually worth? That's the definition of a short sale. Is that the seller owes the bank more in their mortgage than it's actually worth at the time you're trying to sell it. So then the bank has to agree to do to sell it for short what is owed. Doesn't mean it takes less time. It's not a short sale because it takes less time. It actually takes a lot longer. It's short what is owed on the mortgage. That's what a short sale is. And so during the time of short sales, which was, God, it was a while ago now, um, we had to learn this stuff. We had to ask every single one of our sellers, how much do you owe on the property? You had to ask. It seems like a very in invasive question. It's not. It's part of your job. So this is a great listing, pre-listing lead sheet right here. You can have, make copies of this and have it write the information down. Does your doctor write information down? They, now they type right into their computer. They sit right there in the room and they're typing everything. They have questions they're asking on the computer and they're typing it all. They're, they're writing, they're asking from a, a lead sheet of their own. They're asking you lead questions. So these questions are, how did you hear about me? Where are you moving? What's, your, what's motivating you to move there? How soon do you need to be there? If we sell your home in the next 30 days, will, will that pose a problem for you? And why, if it does? What would happen if your home did not sell? How much do you want to list your home for? It's an idea of what they're thinking. How much do you owe on the property? I'll be sending you a packet of information. Will you take a few minutes to review it before we meet? Um, sure, they'll say, yeah, sure. The people who are thorough will read it. The engineer types will read it. The people who are quick, quick in a hurry aren't going to read it, but send it anyway. Do you have any questions before we meet? Will all the decision makers be there when we meet? It's a waste of your time if all the decision makers aren't there and you should reschedule the appointment to when they are all there. Okay, so this is a great sheet. Make copies of it and use it for your presentations. So back to page 30. Fundamentally, you connect, your connection process seeks first to understand. The more questions you ask, the more you understand, the better you're going to be able to service the listing. The better um, project manager you're going to be. Who are they? What do they need or want to do? Where do they want or need to do it? Why do they want or need to do it? When do they want or need to do it? And how? Who, what, where, when, why, and how? Those are the questions that you're seeking to understand. And the more questions you ask, the more information you get, the more in control you're going to be when you actually go to the listing presentation. Does that make sense? Oh gosh, I think I went from, no, I'm, not, I'm right, I'm on track with my, let's see what's next. Okay, so closing for the appointment. Use the lead sheet to get the appointment. The 10 classic closes, oh, the 10, did I miss that page? 10 classic closes are on page 34. So use the lead sheet to get to the appointment. We just talked about that. And the 10 classic closes, different types of closes that will get you the appointment. They're great. Read through those. They're awesome. And pick a few that work for you that are your style. The hard close, the soft close, the direct close, the indirect close, the trial close, the assumptive close, the negative positive close, the take back. I've used that many times. The tie down and the alternative choice close. There's a couple of... Um, 
practice scripts here that I think you should grab um, whoever your uh, script partner is, whoever you practice with, and you should practice these. They're, again, really good for you to learn how this process goes. So on page 32 and 33, they have script one and script two. Script one is they've given you a call. Script two is you've called them. Uh, they might feel a bit robotic, but that's because you need to practice them so that you get in the flow of asking the questions that then turn into the seller lead sheet and getting the answers on the seller lead sheet, okay? All right, this is really important too. So on page 35 is the third part that's on our Zoom or on our uh, slideshow right here, answering questions versus handling objections. So a seller may be asking a question, yet the agent hears an objection. Answering questions and handling objections are two different things. When a question gets asked, you answer it. When an objection comes up, you handle it. So they're not the same thing. This is a something probably uh, fold this page down and come back to it and read it a few times. I'm going to say it again. A seller may be asking a question, yet you're hearing an objection. Uh, a, when a question gets asked, just answer the question. When a, an objection comes up, handle the objection. So then here's what it says for an example. If the client says, what's your commission? You say, my commission is 3%, and I suggest we offer the buyer agent 3%. End of story. If they ask you if you would do it for less, you say, no, I won't. It was just a question. Okay. If they persist or won't move forward, ask what's stopping them from hiring you today. They might say, well, the other agents are willing to do it at 5%, and you're not. Then say, what I hear you saying is the commission you pay is important to you. I'm so happy you brought it up. We'll cover that when we meet. Only handle objections when you get a signature. You can't get a signature over the phone. So over the phone, either, either answer the question or tell them, we'll cover that when we meet. That's a great question. And I'm going to go over all of that when we meet in person. Just some things to think about. Many times they're just asking a question. And it's really not an objection. And it's not an object. And when it is an objection, handle the objection. Okay. All right. There's a couple more things in this section, and then we're going to wrap up. Oh, here's a good one. Who would like to read this quote? Short one, you guys. Who wants to read it? I can read. Yeah. Words of wisdom. The right approach to close for a meeting is the only approach. Ask for it. Thank you. Okay. You guys are in the lead generation business, in the lead conversion business. You're a real estate agent who has food you need to put on the table, bills you have to pay, and a life you want to live. So it's a business worth owning and a life worth living. Okay. You're not in that I want to make friends with everybody business. You're going to make a bunch of friends along the way. You're going to develop some amazing relationships. And those amazing relationships are going to bring you more clients. You got to get to the closing table. That's what you're in the business of. And uh, I personally, when I think about working with a professional, a doctor, I want a doctor who's assertive enough to move me forward. Tell me what the prescription is not just want to go have coffee with me, right? I have doctors who are friends that I like to have coffee with. But when I'm talking about somebody who's going to, um, you know, either operate on me, surgery, that kind of thing, something important, I want them to move me along, right? It goes back to what we talked about. What did you say at the beginning, this process? I think both, uh, maybe it was Jenny and Myrna talked about this being, um, oh, I just blanked. Project management, thank you. This is a project management job. So we want to be moved along. They're seeking you out as a professional because this is your profession and you get to move them along. So you need to get in the driver's seat. 
So the right approach is to close for the meeting. It's the only approach. Ask for it. Let's meet. Those are great questions. The way I work with my clients is I like to sit down and go over my information with you to show you how I'm going to, what I'm going to do to go to work for you and help you get your property sold for the highest price possible in the time frame that works for you. And the way for the way I do that is I like to sit down and meet with you and go over all that information. Okay. Get in the driver's seat with everybody. All right. Um, there, again, this goes back into the role play part. So there are some parts in the role play where, I, again, I would love for you to pick a partner and practice the role play. The more you guys are role playing, it's part of what you should be doing every week to grow your skills. The more you're practicing scripts, the more you're role playing, uh, the better you're going to be when you're actually in the game. So you practice during practice so that you're not practicing during the game. Okay. Warriors played, uh, well, they played better than the opponent did last night. <laughs> Wasn't the greatest game ever, but I'll tell you what, in order for them to come back and win that game last night, it's a heck of a lot of practice that goes on, right? It was a good game. Um, we always like, Warriors are such a great example to talk about, especially when they're continuing to win. Then it moves on to Cultivate. So they talk, talk that step four, it's page 39. Uh, this goes back to that, um, that Y, that V that I talked about, or the Y in the road, or the V in the road that I showed you guys. Um, one way you're going is to a yes, and the other way you're going is to a what? A not yet. So you're always in that circle in the middle of the road where the, um, the, v, the v meets, and you're moving towards either a Y or a not yet. There, I think that was Myrna. Myrna, I muted you. Um, so in cultivating, if you were not able to close yet made a connection, cultivate the prospect until they are ready for the appointment. You have to fill your pipeline and stay in frequent contact because you never know when a seller will say, I'm ready. Top agents refer to this moment as the zero moment of truth. It's the moment when you, your lead becomes able, ready, and willing. And you won't know that if you're not staying in touch with them, okay? So highly productive agents use a 36 touch for most of their database. You recognize when a lead is warm enough to be on an 8x8 or other plans. Oh, I forgot. There was something back here that I was going to refer to. Somehow I missed it. Did there, do you guys remember the 10 days of pain? What page that was on? What page was it? 10 days of pain. Does anybody remember what, they, can you get to that page? Well, anyway, this is amazing. Hey, thank you, Deepak. So 10 days of pain, I, I apologize, I missed it. It's actually a download for you. Abigail, it was one of the downloads that I sent. Could you please drop it in the, um, in the chat for everyone? Thank you. So 10 days of pain comes from a free download document that I am downloading for you that's on Keller Inc. You can go to kellerinc.com, K-E-L-L-E-R-I-N-K, not I-N-C, I-N-K.com. And all of the Keller Williams books that have been written are for sale there. We also have many of the books here in our my office, me and Stacy's office that we can sell to you. One of those books though is called Social and it's a free download. You don't have to purchase it, you download it for free, and you're getting it in the chat right now as a download. And if you are doing social media as part of your lead generation efforts, remember social media is typically used in two ways. It's to stay in touch with the people you already know, but it's also used to cultivate new relationships or meet people that you do not currently know, okay? And that download social, it's about a hundred page book, goes over all the things that you need to do written by Ben Kinney and I think Gary Keller or Jay Papazan on how to create uh, leads through social media. It was written a few years ago, I think it was in 2010. So there are a few things that um, when we think about social media and technology, things have changed since 2010 a little bit. So there's a few things that might be a little bit out of date. They might re reference a few social media platforms that don't even exist anymore. But in a nutshell, 
that's an amazing download. That's an amazing hundred pages for you to read if you're going to be using social media in your in your business as a way to generate leads. What is the name again? The name of it's social, and it just got put in the chat for you to download. Yeah. So if you click on that download, you save it, save the PDF to your computer and read it. And on page 102 of social through 121 is the 10 days of pain lead conversion. So this is you gain a lead, a seller lead uh, through social media. You're not trying to be their friend. You're actually trying to get the lead converted. And it's 10 days to conversion. So what happens in that 10 days is you either convert the lead or the lead stops, you know, they, they stop staying in touch with you and they go away. You're going to know by the end of the 10 days who the real leads are. Okay. So it's really good. The 10 days of pain, it starts on page 102, goes from 102 to 121. That entire book is really good. Okay, there's a couple of things in here that give you your weekly activity trackers, um, your conversion rate trackers, all of that kind of stuff, your call log on page 38, your weekly activity tracker is on page 40. Um, on page 41, uh-oh, hold on. Let's talk about, let's do this. Page 41, Ooh, sorry, there we go. Let's think about uh, in taking action, the most important things, you need to know your numbers, you need to learn your conversions, you need to create a lead generation plan, and you need to learn your lead conversion model. Um, what would be something that uh, is an action item for you to do next? What would be your one thing you're gonna work on next, other than taking the next three classes in this series? What else are you going to work on? Do you have a listing presentation? Do you have a pre-listing package? Script practice, Script practice role playing. Uh, I, I'm going to tell people if you're newer in this business, one of my tricks at the beginning was I actually role played with my mother-in-law. I role play with my best friend and her husband, who I happen to be in contract with right now, <laughs> 21 years later. Um, that's, they, they've referred me other business over the years, but I happen to be helping them sell and buy something right now. And I role played with them at the beginning. So I, it's okay to role play with other agents and practice with other agents. That's in, important. And it's great to pick uh, some family members or some very close friends, because what happens when you do that is you're actually role playing in front of a consumer. Mm -hmm. So you get feedback from a consumer perspective. Okay, I did my listing presentation in front of my mother-in-law at her kitchen table and I screwed up at one point and I was like, wait, time out, rewind, I wanna do that part again. And I was able to practice it again in front of her. And she pushed me and she gave me really hard questions that I had to learn how to answer. It was so great at building my skills because she pushed me from the direction of a consumer, not another agent. When you practice with another agent, the first thing they're thinking about is how they would do it not what's going to put you push you further but if you practice in front of someone who loves you and cares about you and is a consumer they're going to push you like a consumer with and they're going to ask you tough questions so practice in front of a few people that are close to you the second reason that's important is it creates cheerleaders for you mm -hmm. these people look at how serious you're taking your business and they're so impressed with you that they're going to start recommending you to everybody they know Okay, man, you should work with Jenny. You should work with Alexis. You should work with Yvonne. They are so serious about their business. You should see how serious they are. They will be such a professional with you. The best thing you can do for a long-term business is to create cheerleaders, okay? So those would be my major points. The, you guys think about what your one thing is. It's the next thing you're gonna work on. The one, quen, one thing question is, we have a book on that too, by the way. What's the one thing that I should do right now such by doing that one thing, it makes, makes everything else fall into place or become unnecessary? What's the one thing I should do right now such by doing that one thing, it makes everything else fall into place or become unnecessary? Typically the one thing is lead generation. So think about your next one thing. Think about the major points you learned today. 
and get excited about what we're gonna learn in the next three classes. And then if you would please, we're almost done. I would love to hear some, ah some ahas from you about today, what you learned today. What's something that stood out? This is Myrna. Hi, Myrna. Um, I think for me, I think it's improving the process. I think the fact that I have my first listing is actually creating some kind of process. Uh, and this was very helpful just to get an idea where to start. So thank you for the class. You're welcome. And we've got more good content coming. I hope you're able to attend all of them. Of course, we are recording it as well. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Do you have an aha? Uh -huh. Efficiency is important. How quickly you move on the lead. There was one point, and I didn't read it, is how quickly do you follow up on a lead? Someone calls you. Are you returning the call within an hour? Does it take you a couple of hours? Does it take you a couple of days? So that's something to think about. And then the able, ready, and willing part, are they ready to move forward? And are you ready to move forward with them? Let me say one thing about listing presentation. Your listing presentation is never final. 20 years in the business, I'm always making improvements to my listing presentation. However, my listing presentation is done well enough that I can grab it today and head to a listing appointment today. So you want a listing presentation that is ready to go that you can continue to make improvements on. There's never, it's no such thing as final product. I'm never going to have to change it again. You're always going to make changes to it. But you want a product that's good enough that you can use to go on to your listing presentations, which I'm sure Alan's going to talk about on Thursday. Any other, oh, hi, Jenny. Any other um, final ahas for today? What are the two things that you are in business for? What's the number one most important thing you're in business for that you're doing in your business? Number one, lead generation and everything else. Anything else? Any other ahas? You may think of um, pre-qualifying your lead is very important. You don't have to working with everyone and also you need to filter like, their timelines right yeah yeah so you don't have to work with everyone you have to pre-qualify you've got to ask lots of questions so that yeah. you know if they are able great. ready and willing great thank you any other final thoughts All right, you guys, I'm letting you go 10 minutes early. So thank you for being here with me today. Hey, just a reminder, tomorrow is the insider meeting at 1030 tomorrow morning here in person with lunch to follow. So we look forward to seeing all of you tomorrow here in person at the office at 1030. Thank you all for being here with me today. See you tomorrow. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.